I begin with a story about my old Italian grandpa who was nearing death and lying in bed. He suddenly caught the aroma of his favorite Italian Anazette cookies wafting up from the kitchen downstairs. He gathered his remaining strength and he lifted himself out of the bed with great effort, uh, worked his way to the edge of the room, uh, held onto the railing at the top of the stairs and slowly, agonizingly made his way downstairs. <laughs> he got to the kitchen doorway and he stood there propped against the door, gazing in at what made him feel like he already had gone to heaven, which was a table and counter overflowing with hundreds of his favorite cookies. <laughs> He thought, well, maybe it, this is heaven, or maybe it's just one more act of love from his wife of 60 years. Well, whatever it was, he mustered his final efforts, you know, and he moved his way right over to the table, knelt down in front of the table, and already could taste the anisette. You know, if you've had a, a house full of that flavor of anisette, you can already taste it before you put anything in your mouth. Well, that's where he was at. And so he reached out with his frail and trembling hand to the edge of the table. He put his grasp around one cookie. And as he was about to pull it from the table, my grandmother's spatula landed on his hand and she said, back off, there for the funeral. <laughs> well, listen, of course it was not my grandfather, but I wish it was because I love that story. And it reminds me so much of my uh, culture of growing up as an Italian American woman. And of course, this message is the opposite of the message of thriving, is it not? It speaks of not enoughness. To thrive means to flourish, to prosper, to be successful, to blossom. Thriving is natural to us. Do we believe that? You know, thriving, knowing that thriving is natural to us means that we, we shouldn't have to struggle for it. We don't have to qualify for it or earn our way to thriving. We don't have to embark upon a search for it. Interestingly, and kind of sadly, the cause of my mother's death was failure to thrive. You know, I'd never heard failure to thrive associated with an 89-year-old person. I'd only heard it connected to an infant who you know, fails to latch on to mother's breast and ends up dying of malnutrition. Failure to thrive. I wondered why and, and, and what, what is that all about? But it started to kind of make sense to me when I gave it more thought. Now, let me say my mom thrived in many ways throughout her life, sometimes heroically. She also lived with an incessant undercurrent of messaging from early in her life that I do see got in the way of her thriving. And so here are some of the things that I noticed. My mother displayed an embedded belief about her insufficiency. When one of her children would ace a test or shine at a piano recital, my mom would almost perplexedly declare, I don't know where they got all this talent. I have none of it. And she was serious. This from a woman who magically made meals, including packed lunches that lined the entire countertop for <laughs> with the distinctions for each one of her seven children of what we preferred, what we liked and didn't like every single day in a house that was so clean at the time that her friends declared that you could eat off those floors. But raising seven children, my mom didn't see herself well. She always put herself down. You know, maybe this applies to you in some way. Maybe it applies to me in some way, this insufficiency. Like, 
when I uncover a pattern of hesitating to put my name in for a promotion or withdrawing from an academic degree program, you know, multiple times or bailing on relationships, the instant conflict arises, it could be of an because of an embedded belief about insufficiency. I think of this as patterned helplessness, right? I am not enough. Mom would say, and she learned this with her religious upbringing, that you know she should never complain about her troubles because other people had it so much worse. I heard it from my sister too, who felt like, who was she to be happy when there were so many miserable people? Thoughts like these, or maybe thoughts like, you know, when I'm frustrated by continuous emergencies arising to deplete the little bit of savings I just finally managed to accumulate. Or I get jealous when someone else receives the accolades or gets recognition. I could be operating with a primal insecurity. I also think of it as not enoughness, right? Which says there is not enough. Now, my mother was an adult child of an alcoholic. That at least partially may account for her learned worthlessness. Despite being saddled as the eldest daughter with adult responsibilities from a very young age, my mother grew up internalizing a message that says, who do you think you are? Or why would anyone care about what you have to say? Well, if you recognize any of those messages, that tend to get reinforced time and again, right? By feeling irrelevant in, the, in a relationship or even in the workplace. It could be learned worthlessness that says, I am unnecessary. I am not enough. There is not enough. I am unnecessary. The struggle is understandable. And the question is how to turn an entire culture of failure to thrive, how to turn it around in addition to whatever professional therapy we might need. Well, what comes to mind for most of us when we think about thriving is money. A certain amount of money is necessary for basic survival, of course, and a higher amount can make all the difference in our opportunities to rise in Mad Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, from survival to self-actualization. It'll be no surprise to hear from a metaphysician like me when I say that building a consciousness of thriving requires of us a firm foundation of spiritual understanding about intrinsic sufficiency, abundance, and inherent worth. Well, here's what I know. The toughest assignment is convincing my humanity about my divinity. Is that true for you? I mean, to acknowledge that oneness means I cannot be outside of all that is. That it's not in me like Butterworth's proverbial wiener in a bun. It is me, the ineffable aspect of me, the grand mystical me beyond human perception. The I am, which is not something or someone else. It's what I think of as the spiritual counterpart to the material self. This is key, a spiritual counterpart to the material self. It is in the spiritual realm, the non-physical or invisible atmosphere where sufficiency, abundance, and worth are accessible and can be experienced. You know, these aspects of thriving all can be argued against or denied outright when we view ourselves as only human, grounded in physicality alone. Why? Because the realm of physicality operates within form and definition. And definition means of finite nature. So isn't it understandable that our minds would imagine insufficiency, not enoughness, and worthlessness in the face of physical limitations? And this is why I believe we need spiritual understanding to break beyond physical limitation. 
This is why, in my understanding, we need, we study spirituality to uncover the counterpart to our physical, which, of course, is our spiritual or divine identity. Well, spiritual study and practice helps us to increase our innate ability to boldly express spiritual principles in the middle of everyday situations and to experience as well as to express our infinite capacities, to get to a state of awareness, to build a consciousness in which I can declare authentically, as I wrote in my book, Divine Audacity, I am courageously responsive. I am fearlessly reflective and self-corrective. I'm intentional in large and small aims. I hold myself accountable for thoughts, words, and actions to be in integrity with my divine identity. I dare to ignore the way things are and what cannot be done, bringing about the seemingly impossible. I suspend belief in limitations that seem inherent in human existence long enough to stretch beyond the known capacity. And I'm never crushed by the weight of my commitments. I uphold the world, all beings, and all intentions in the light of magnificent possibility. I lift up rather than tear down. With divine audacity, I am the light of the world, shining brightly. Well, let's talk about the ABCs of thriving. The A of thriving, there's three A's. There's acknowledgement, there's an admitting, and there's allowing the light, right? So to acknowledge the light is to simply acknowledge the source of all power. All that is, if you want to call it God, fine, but I think of it as the source power of all power that is, right? It's nothing personal. It's universal light. And so how does this play out? When I'm experiencing distressing medical symptoms, I can acknowledge life, the source of vitality. When my sweetheart and I are not seeing eye to eye, I can acknowledge love, the source of harmony. And when I'm worried about dwindling savings in my account, I can acknowledge imagination, the source of vision. Or I can acknowledge faith, the source of perception, or will, the source of commitment. But it's not enough to just acknowledge a source. I have to admit that it is the truth about me. I have to admit it. I have to face up to this amazing fact of my capacity, right? As Fillmore said, and you can read this in Talks on Truth. It is your mission to express all that you can imagine God to be. Let this be your standard of achievement. Never lower it, nor allow yourself to be belittled by the cry of sacrilege. You hear that? You know, he knows that this is tough. It's tough to convince my human of my divinity, right? So he goes on to say, you can attain to everything that you can imagine. If you can imagine it is possible to God, it is also possible to you. So here's the rub. If we accept that all we know about God is also true about us, about the truth of us, we must accept personal responsibility for our thoughts, our words, our actions. We can no longer pretend helplessness in the face of our human conditions. Hmm. Admitting our divine identity requires us then to draw from, to claim and express aspects of this one power consciously every day. We have to live from this realization. It requires audacity. And the third A in this ABCs, the third A is to allow the light. Now, this is my word for what is classically called surrender. I use the word allow because it really is a different energy to me than surrender, which too often smacks of, of um, giving up, you know, or giving over to something else or someone else. But to allow the light, think about this in terms of unity's practice of denial and affirmation. When you hear this, some examples. So back to these three examples that I've led with. 
when I allow, I, I allow conditioned thinking to drop away. So that's my release. And I allow spiritual vitality, even while my physical body experiences medical symptoms. You hear that? I'm taking that power of life and I'm allowing it. I'm allowing the abs the opposite of it to drop away and I'm allowing it to rise. I allow conditioned thinking I allow inharmonious thoughts and conditioned thinking to subside in the light of harmonious love. I allow love to reign uppermost in my thoughts, see? So I'm letting go of thoughts that are incompatible with love, and I'm allowing love to rise. Or I allow distressing imaginings to give way to my vision for success and thriving. Or I allow false perceptions to shrink as I allow the clarity of faith to see a truth in my situation going forward. I allow unwillingness to diminish as I then allow a clear choice and commitment of will to be my dominant thought. I allow. So that's the A's of thriving, to acknowledge, to admit, and to allow the light. B, beam that light. So what do we mean? Shine it, express it, practice it. This is unity's fifth of the five principles, right? It's action. Realize it. Make it real in time and space. And so how might I do that? Well, I can shine the light of vitality into every material and non-material space in my body and in my consciousness when I am dealing with a medical condition. In that situation of, of having disharmony in my relationship, I beam the light of harmony into every crevice of my brain. I breathe harmony in and harmony out with every cycle of respiration. I'm taking it on, you see, I'm taking it on, I'm beaming it, I'm practicing it, I'm getting good at experiencing it. And I speak and write of my vision every day, practicing my power of imagination. I look deeper than the surface of things to perceive the truth beneath the surface of the seeming financial challenge. I hold myself accountable for the commitments that I have made to myself to thrive no matter what. So that's A, B, and C. The C of thriving is to claim the light. And this means to embody it, right? To identify with it, to name it as my identity. I am love. I am strength. I am power, right? Jesus says this in, uh, in the Gospels. When you see me, you see the Father. In the Gospel of Philip, it says that, that what you see in the spiritual realm is what you are. So when you see the father, you are the father. And so we can rightfully claim, I am the vitalizing power of life, living fully today. See, I'm embodying it. I'm claiming that power fully. I'm putting it to work in my life. I am using it or embodying it and displaying it fully for the benefit of that which I have in mind, that which has been my prayer concern, that which has been my call to thrive, you see. Or I am the harmonizing power of love, able to gently hold contrasting energies, let, just like different instruments in an orchestra can harmonize with the melody. You see, I'm capable of this. Or I am the visioning power of imagination, feeling today what I am setting in motion for my future or I am the perceiving power of faith, disregarding the appearance for a moment of clear awareness of what is most true and important. I am the choice-making power of will, committed to such a degree that I am willing even when I'd rather not follow through. Well, friends, study each and every one of your 12 powers. Take them one by one, one aspect of each at a time, Reflect on how you can use them, how you can develop them, how you can practice them every day. 
because it is this that allows us to thrive. It is knowing what we are and using that knowledge in the real day-to-day nitty-gritty time and space in which we find our physical being. You can shine the adjusting power of order when your plan for the day changes due to circumstances beyond your control. You can shine the cleansing power of release or negation to nullify self-condemnation. You can shine the audacity of zeal when it's your turn to speak into a microphone. You can shine the tenacity of strength while moving through a process toward a goal. There's no shortcut. You know, honoring of my full humanity is as essential as is claiming my full divinity. So study and practice, develop spiritual understanding of your divine identity, which is fully human and fully divine. You know, you can realize, which means make it real in time and space, your full identify, your full identity. Because as I know my full identity, I naturally express, experience and express my intrinsic enoughness, my sufficiency. I am enough. I have enough. I have a consciousness of plenty. And I am valuable. These things become like natural to us to know and understand the more we recognize I am divine, that my nature is divine or spiritual, that I have it in me because all that is natural, all that is God, all that I notice about the divine is also the truth about me and I can act like it. So the question is never whether we live in an abundant universe. The question is whether we live in an abundant consciousness. Hmm. With these principles, not only can I thrive in my day-to-day living, but now I am available for essential service. You know, I can rightly declare now, I am the light of the world shining brightly. And that means that in my presence, others remember the truth of their nature. In my presence, others heal any illusion of separation. Imagine that. In my presence, in my illumined presence, others stand tall and they behave humanely. They snap back from self-pity and self-derision to claim their spiritual capacities. In my presence, others sense and act from their essential goodness. In my presence, others come home to themselves, to the self that is not their personality, but is their divine identity. Let's meditate, friends, and let's meditate on the whole spiritual human that you are, that we are. So sit in your posture for prayer, fully in your body. You know, let's not let's not ignore the human on the way to re- realization of our spiritual nature. Mm-hmm. So fully in your body, bless your breath. Mm-hmm. Close your eyes if you'd like. Ah. Sit in such a way that amplifies your ability to be attentive and yet relax, restful in your body. Bless your breath, bless your pulse, bless your circulation, bless the universe of cells, tissues, and organs, your whole physical operating system. Notice your emotions and honor them, for they are appropriate and essential. Pay attention now to the edge of your body, to the very, very edge of your skin. Bring your awareness there and notice there 
where your skin meets the air around you. Notice any sensations, any shift in temperature. Hmm. And for a moment, just imagine that you didn't have a border at all. Imagine just erasing the edges of your own body where the you of you, that ineffable, that spiritual you just, just flows out. <laughs> that, that part of you that's just not at all physical just flows out and mingles with the atmosphere around you and flows into the universe. And you find there is no separate you. And here there is no absence, only presence. The presence of infinite love, life. Wisdom, peace, power. Experience, just be in a moment of silence. Just be in this infinity. In this state of mind, in infinity, in an awareness of your spiritual nature, look upon your physical being and your body of human experience. Turn on the light of healing love, the adjusting power of order, intuitive wisdom and any principle that you might need. Bathe in it right now. Let the human you know it is divine. Acknowledge, admit, and allow. I am whole. I am one. I am a divine human. Mm. Breathing in awareness now. Let that divine tell the message to the human. <laughs> I am one. I am whole. I am a divine human. Breathing this message, letting it sit in your mind and in your heart as the great truth that you know that you need to know in order to thrive in every way. For this awareness, 
I'm so appreciative. And I say, and so it is. And so it is. <laughs>